There we go. So there's hope for us. So once again, welcome everyone to our tarot class. And we've started recording and more and more people are coming in. So we'll just give them a few minutes. And I will then begin. So last two weeks ago, since we all had 4th of July and skipped it, coming in for the class, we covered just an overview, an introduction. We also covered the symbols, colors, planets, and zodiac signs. This is just an overview, just to kind of give you an idea that on these tarot cards, these symbols are used. We also went through the astrological symbolism of the seven planets and the seven chakras, which are energy centers in our bodies. And uh, we also talked about the colors that are used in the keys. So this evening, and we briefly looked at one of the cards, the Fool card, and I introduced you to the Tarot Tableau. So this evening, I'm going to move on to the letters on the cards. And I will add that if you ever want to watch the recording, you will find it at the website, which is a YouTube site called Gates of Light. You can see on here, Gates of Light, but it's on YouTube. And you'll see the recording there. And it will be one of the most current items on the site. So let's look at the letters on the cards. I will just give you an overview as a reminder of, let's go and grab this. This is the tarot tableau. So just so you get a feeling for where we are this evening. The tarot tableau relates to the all 22 major arcana cards. The deck of cards is 78 number. There are 78 cards in the entire deck. But we only work with, in this class, the tarot tableau cards, the 22, which are the major arcana. The other parts of the deck are the cards that you would normally use when you're playing cards like gin rummy or poker or canasta or any of these other card games. There are four suits. Each suit also has kings, queens, jacks, and so when, and pay, in this case, the tarot deck has pages. So you have four suits and the four suits represent actually the four elements. So even though we call them clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades, they are fire, they are fire air, earth, and water when translated into the tarot. So this is just a reminder, and there's a tarot tableau, this particular one, there's two kinds that we work with, but this particular one was developed by Paul Foster Case. He founded, created the Builders of the Adidam, fabulous place, and they, uh, a master of the work, that's all I could say, just a master of the work. So um, let's move along. And here you will see the card that we'll be covering today. But first, we're going to do a little continued review, which will take us to the letters on the card. So here we go. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. As mentioned in my introduction to the tarot, the Hebrew letters were chosen by the ancients because they each have three attributes. They are a letter a number, and a word or concept. Because they each have three attributes, okay. I was just thinking, can everyone see this fairly well? That's my only concern is, should I make it larger? Anything like that? Starting, okay. All right, so this is similar to the choice to use Greek and Latin in science and botany. According to the Sefer Yetzirah, or Book of Formation, which is an underlying book for the Kabbalah, 
The Hebrew letters are grouped into three different categories. There are three mother letters, three seven double letters, and 12 simple letters. Each letter has been assigned to a tarot key. The term key for each card signifies that each card is being used to unlock a particular door in your mind. The three mother letters are S, H, A, and M, representing the first elements. So the first elements are fire, air, and water, and key 20, which is card 20, is shin, judgment, realization. So that's the concept behind that card. We're just doing an overview. You don't have to worry about memorizing anything at this point. As we go into each card, it'll make more sense, but it gives you an idea that there's a structure. I think God was going into bookkeeping when he started this whole thing, because it makes it real easy to categorize various places of various attributes and then place them together in different combinations. So we have key zero, the card that we are going to talk about today. Its letter is A. A is pronounced alf in Hebrew. The, it's the fool and it represents super consciousness. It also covers the element air. Key 12, M for mem, and the key for that is called the suspended man. Some people know this particular uh, card as the hang, hanging man. Its action is reversal and its element is water. So I'll show you those three on here. So you have 20, zero and 12. So here you have 20 down here. It's a judgment card. Here's zero up here and 12 is the hanged man. Quite an interesting card. He's hanging by one foot and his body structure is a particular symbol and his head is all lit up in white. So that would represent he's illumined going through reversal. So the next set of letters are the seven double letters and they are B, G, D, K, P, R, and T, H. They are considered double letters because each is assigned the attribute of a pair of opposites. One manifestation is positive and constructive. The other is negative and destructive. Each letter can be spoken aspirated or unaspirated. They are each assigned to a planet reflecting that planet's particular vibration. Important to remember is that these are polar opposites. So this is kind of intriguing. Key one is B, Beth, the magician card. And that card represents life and death. Mercury is the planet. Key two is G, Gimel, the high priestess card, peace and strife, and represents the moon. Key three is D for Daleth, the empress card, wisdom and folly, and is representing Venus, the planet Venus. Let's look at these because you can see them. Let's see if I can move this over, not lose anything. So you can actually look at them as we try and get to them. So key 16, P or Peth is tower. And if I'm correct, there's that tower with two people falling off and that's grace and sin. And it represents Mars, the planet Mars. Key 19 is Resh, the sun. And you'll see the sun here. Fertility and sterility is represented by that key. And there's the sun, the planet of this. The, it's considered a quote planet. Key 21, which I'll slide this over briefly, is over here. And it is TH or TAV, TAV. It represents the key, the cosmos, and it represents dominion and slavery. 
and the planet is Saturn. So just to continue, the 12 simple letters relate to the signs of the zodiac and each letter is assigned to a function. The five senses and speech are mentioned first. As you may recall from my post on the zodiac, every sign represents a part of the human body. The human body is a magical kingdom, the place where the spirit, your spirit, resides. Hopefully, as you follow these posts, you will begin to get a sense of not only how beautiful your body is, but also how to operate it to bring out its full potential and thus your inner full potential. You have been given an amazing gift by your parents, a body that will allow you to realize your, not your neighbors, not your families, but your full spiritual potential. I always remind my students to take good care of their bodies. Look both ways when they cross the street. Don't text while driving. Feed it healthy food. Exercise it. And it will provide them with a long life. <laughs> because we'll need a long life to give us the ample time necessary to study and learn from the many lessons that life will present to each of us, whether we want them or not. You will find the tarot to be very helpful with these lessons. So here are the 12 simple letters. And I'll slide this over and you can kind of get a glance. So key four is he or emperor, sight. You have key five is Bob, teacher, hearing. And we'll describe uh, what attributes are on the keys in order to remember what they stand for. Key six, Zane, is the lovers, and it has to do with smell, which is kind of interesting. And key seven, Chef, chariot, speech. And that's over here. Let's see. Key nine is Yod, the hermit, here. And that has to do with touch. 11 is Lahmed, and that's justice. And it has to do with action. Key 13, none, has to do with transition or motion. See if I can move that over a little. And 14, Samki, is temperance. And it stands for wrath. Key 15 is iron which is I, uh, adversary and mirth. Most entertaining that this nasty looking guy here, the attribute is mirth, which is to say, if you're gonna go on this path, you do need a sense of humor, you will, because things are incongruent. Um, when you start working in the spiritual world, you start to have experiences that are not fully understandable in our world, in the world of all you see is all there is. And since that's not the case, then your eye, your sight starts to develop, you see more and the adversary where you would think everything's going to hell in a basket and then you realize it really isn't. And that's where you need a sense of humor. You need to be able to laugh at yourself. You need to have joy in your life, which is what our creator gives us, joy. Besides all those little bumps we have to get over. Key 17 is TZ. Zadi, the star, and it stands for meditation, which is this card. And key 18 is Koth or Quaff, and it stands for the moon and sleep. It also, Koth is also stands, it um, signifies the back of the head. And we'll learn that the medulla oblongata in the back of the head runs the automatic systems in our house, in, in our house, in our vehicle, in our life, in the body in which we live. 
So moving on, as you look over the names of the keys, you will find a few that have been given a different name than used here. For example, teacher instead of hierophant, another adversary instead of devil. As we go over each key, this will be discussed. So the next item I wanted to cover are symbols used in the zodiac. And in this case, there are some very basic symbols that are used that are somewhat universal. Does anybody have any questions? I know this is a little hard, but um, because there are so many of us. You can always raise your hand or take yourself off mute and say, I want to ask something. You're all welcome to do that at any time. So the tarot is filled with symbols. Symbols are like icons. They each have a meaning that will guide you to a fuller understanding of the tarot. For instance, there are symbols for the planets and the zodiac, each conveying a concept or idea. And of course, we went through some of the symbols last week, especially the planets. It's most fascinating that there's only three um, types of symbols that combined create all the different planets. So you have a circle across, a circle across, and the uh, the moon, the crescent moon, and that combination of them both describes an attitude and what's being expressed about that planet is where, how they connect, whether the circle is above the cross, below the cross, to the right of it, all of these things convey something because the tarot was set up to not be read. It was set up to be, take advantage of the universality of symbolism. If it were all to be read, then it would all be in one language. And the upside of this, once you learn the symbols, and also remember, most people didn't read or write, quote, back in the day. And so in having things presented to them in universal symbols, they were able to understand what the cards were saying, because each card is it's like reading a paragraph, reading a paragraph, reading a story a story and all of it is about you. And just, we'll continue a little more here. So we have, these are the basics, the circle, the triangle and the square. The dot, the meaning is that of a seed. It's a the central point of a circle. The central point is the archetype of any idea. The circle, this always represents the creator, God without beginning or end enclosing his universe. The crescent. The crescent symbolizes a cup which receives all that life pours into it. It is a reflecting principle or not I in which the I am sees an image of itself. The straight line. The, the line is an extension from the central point, the manifestation of the archetype. So the dot now is moving out. The horizontal line represents the rod and matter. The vertical line represents the spirit in action as well as the staff, the upright body of man and the spinal column of man. The wavy or zigzag line indicates vibratory action. Two of these lines together are the symbol for dissolving the return to an original state. So we'll go to the cross. Here is combined both horizontal and vertical lines, the rod and the staff. It shows the material world as the horizontal line influenced by spirit, the vertical line, the line that raises us up. It is sometimes called the cross of matter. Remember Jesus said to the rich man, now go and sell all your goods and pick up your cross and follow me. It is sometimes called the cross of matter. It also refers to the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water. A cross implies vital action and union. When held to matter, the spirit must manifest its creative forces 
in material ways. So the symbol of the cross is matter and spirit combined. And when held, when the spirit is held to matter, the spirit must manifest its creative forces in material ways. There we are. We are spirit. Jesus said, God, our father, wishes to be worshiped in spirit. So we are spirit. We reside within matter. This is fire, air, earth, and water, all this good stuff here that we float around in, our little vehicles. And each of you is a star. Remember, when you look up in the sky and you look at the sun, that is a star. And each of you is a star. And your solar system is your body. So the symbols start to explain that. When held to matter, the spirit must manifest its creative forces in material ways. So therefore the spirit moves through you and you create because you are spirit. All these goodies we have around us, pencils, computers, me rattling on, all of this is creating using spirit. The square, this represents the cube and the four elements. It is the most solid of figures and therefore implies foundation and base. Measurement and the establishment of order, the taking on of responsibility are its attributes. That's the square. The triangle is considered a perfect figure implying completion. It represents spirit in three modes of expression, will, wisdom and activity. It is also a symbol of the law used in prayer. So the symbol of the law, when you think of the law, quote unquote, it just means how things are made. How does creation work? How do you create? And there's, a, there's a, only one way it works. And you start to understand that so the Tarot is all about how you create. In Egypt, it symbolized the Holy Family, Os Osiris, Isis, Isis, and Horus. The Christian and Hindu counterparts are God the Father and Brahma the Creator, the Son as the Savior and Vishnu as the Preserver, and finally the Holy Spirit and Shiva the Transformer. So you can see this is running across multiple, quote, religions. And just to mention that the tarot works with the foundational premises of most of the religions. So if there are differences in religious expression, it's usually because people live in different parts of the planet Earth. They just haven't met so-and-so on the far side of the earth. So they express God in what they know according to the way they live and their family and friends and their tribes. I mean, we have our tribes. I have a, I'm in the tribe of California, I think, somehow. <laughs> God, what an interesting mind. And so everyone has these little sort of changes and different attributes, but in reality, the, the tarot tries to address them as one, saying, yes, it acknowledges all of these differences exist, but they're not really, in essence, differences. So that's why you'll see mentioned in the classes that we will refer to, well, we refer to Egypt here, Hinduism, and It's most interesting. Um, the other thing about the tarot is because all the information is put in a deck of cards, the people who carry the cards can study them and learn more about themselves without having to fear for their lives. So the fearing for their lives is because they may not line up with the time 
that they live in. So say there's a purge of certain religions going on three, 400 years ago. It's a good, you know, they, it just protects them. They're able to study the initiations. They're able to study the inner teachings of all of the religions without fear. We forget that when the, the Bible was first printed, it was illegal to put the Bible into the vernacular. In fact, it was so illegal that they would actually take a printer, a person who was printing into the local language, the Bible out of Greek or Latin, and they would draw and quarter him. Nasty. So, You have to remember that you, there, there's a reason why this is all in symbols, multiple symbols. And finally, we all have access to the Bible. In fact, it's in most hotel rooms. But I want you to know, people gave up their lives. They, they, they printed it and then they hid. Mm -hmm. This was to get the word of God out to everyone. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous. So there we are. I have someone, Teresa is in, okay, good. <laughs> so that's a, another reason why all of this is written in symbols. So let's go back up just the triangle. So all of these triads and trinities must refer to three aspects of consciousness. There are, these are super consciousness, self consciousness, and subconsciousness. In the tarot, we really don't accept the term unconsciousness since there is no such place outside of the one thing. From the smallest crystal of sand to the largest organism, there is consciousness. Let's take the above a little further and see how these symbols are used in the names of the seven heavenly bodies familiar to the ancients. Interestingly enough, the seven symbols are constituted from the use of only three of the symbols above, the circle, the cross, and the crescent, which I just mentioned. The circle represents superconsciousness, the cross represents self-consciousness, and the crescent represents subconsciousness. Note that the seven heavenly bodies also refer to the seven chakras of the Kundalini. And I will add one thing, if you were not here last week, I brought up the fact that the tarot is a book and it is about three characters, only three characters. And we have just brought up those three characters, which is the superconscious mind, the self-conscious mind and the subconscious mind. So you have God, man and woman feminine, masculine, creative, destructive. So these are the three characters we're going to learn about. The sun, a circle with a dot in the middle, is the heart, the cardiac plexus. The moon, a crescent, is the pituitary body up here. Mercury combines all three elements with a crescent. And we covered this last week, so I'll do it very quickly subconsciousness, facing up, receiving on top of a circle, superconsciousness, which is then above a cross, self-consciousness. Thus, it represents the equilibrium of all three. An equilibrium, e equilibrium is the goal of the course, is for each of you to be in that state of equilibrium. Subconsciousness has been purified and is raised to become the grail to receive the inspiration of spiritual wisdom. And it's represented in the body as the pineal body. Mars is a circle combined with a cross which slants to one side on the ascendant on the right side. It's the prostatic ganglion sympathetic nervous system throughout our body. Venus is a circle above a cross, which is the pharyngeal plexus, which is the thyroid. Saturn, a cross above a crescent facing left or back, 
is the sacral plexus, which is the point of excretion. And Jupiter is a crescent facing left or back above a cross. Solar plexus, abdominal brain. As you can see, the heavenly bodies represent nerve centers in the body, plus the pituitary and pineal glands. And I think our last one is the zodiac. Let's go check out the zodiac. And nobody, nobody's trying to get a hold of me. Good, no. So, so the zodiac, which is the stars around us, has a great deal to do with the tarot. The zodiac literally, circle of animals, that's what it translates to, consists of 12 signs in the heavens, each of which represents an area of the body according to the ancient wisdom teachings. Aries represents the head and face. Now this isn't that easy to see, but you get the idea. Taurus represents the neck and throat. Gemini represents the lungs, collarbone, arms, and hands. Everything in twos, you can see. Cancer represents the breast and stomach. Leo represents the sides, back, and heart. The heart of a lion. Yeah, that's easy to remember. Virgo represents the intestines. and the intestines control the nervous system. So what you put in your body, what you eat and goes in your intestines, that in the ancients would call it becomes mother's milk. It becomes this child that's in your gut. And then that's what feeds the rest of your body, your nervous system. So if you don't put good stuff in, you know, bad stuff in, bad stuff out kind of thing, yeah, that's why I mentioned earlier, if you're going to be on the path and you want to live a long time so you can learn stuff before you have to reincarnate again, a most annoying thing, you then want to take good, very good care of your intestines. So Libra represents kidneys, loins, back. Scorpio represents the sex organs. Sag Sagittarius represents the hips, thighs, and liver. Capricorn represents the knees, Aquarius, the ankles and blood. Pisces represents the feet. So each sign is ruled by a planet or luminary. It isn't necessary for you to believe in astrology. Remember, you are just trying to become familiar with a symbolic language that has been used since antiquity in order to understand the astrological allusions on the cards. The rulings are as follow. Air, Aries, the ram, is ruled by Mars. Taurus, the ox, is ruled by Venus. Gemini, the twins, is ruled by Mercury. Cancer, the crab, is ruled by the moon. All of this will come up as we go over each card. Leo, the lion, is ruled by the sun. Virgo, the virgin, is ruled by Mercury. Libra, the balance, is ruled by Venus. Scorpio, the scorpion, is ruled by Mars. Sagittarius, the archer, is ruled by Jupiter. Capricorn, the goat, is ruled by Saturn. Aquarius, the water bearer, is ruled by Uranus. And Pisces, the fishes, is ruled by Neptune. Oh, I remember when I first started studying this, I went, there's no way. And I, I, I will never remember this stuff. And thank God for the cards, because actually what happens is as you study each card, it, it starts to make sense. I, in my format is I made Excel spreadsheets of all of this because it was a whole lot easier when I wanted to understand who did what to who kind of thing. But uh, when you're first introduced to this, it's like, oh God, it's a lot of stuff. The moon is exalted in Taurus, Mercury is exalted in Virgo, Venus is exalted in Pisces. And in astrology, the strongest are strongest in the signs in which they rule, in the signs in which they are exalted, they have their next greatest power. The following gives the exaltations. So Jupiter is exalted in Cancer, Saturn in 
Libra, Uranus and Scorpio and Neptune in Leo. The lines which divide the 12 parts of the circle of the zodiac are called cusps. As we begin to explore the symbols on the cards, keep in mind that this wheel of the zodiac represents the circulation of the one energy, also known as the life force and the love force through all the channels of human expression. So there's that wonderful symbol. Let's see, are we ready? Okay, we're almost on now. Just give an intro to the tarot cards. It should go quickly. And then we'll start on the fool. So I've, I've gone over the fact that these are the major arcana and that there are 78 cards in the deck. And the arcana cards are the picture cards also called trump cards. The rest of the deck is our familiar playing cards for kings and queens. But instead of jacks, there are both four knights and four pages. So there is that difference. There's 56 cards in the minor arcana. The word arcane refers to secrets or mysteries. Their actual origin is lost in ancient times. The story goes that priests and teachers were entrusted in preserving their teachings and so created this deck of cards to be used for gaming. In this way, the, their initiates could carry them in plain sight. You will find reference to many philosophies and religions in the pictures. This may also be why they are also called tarot keys. Here are keys that will unlock the doors of the hidden mysteries of life. And there's this. And here's the other format. There are many ways to study the cards. To begin, we will look at each key individually. Later, we will arrange them in what is referred to as a tarot tableau, which is what this is and this. There are two that I'm presenting here. The first has them arranged in three horizontal rows. That's this one of seven cards each with a fool at the top. And this, as I mentioned earlier, was created by Paul Foster Case and may be found on the, the website of his organization, he has since passed away, called buildersoftheadatum.org. The second tarot tableau has the cards arranged in five horizontal rows of five cards each with the full card on the right side and the world on the left. This arrangement was created by Right Reverend Helen Blyton. The Hebrew language is always written in this way, right to left. And this per permits the fool to move forward into the manifestation of all of his potential. So she commented in her book, Jewels of the Wise, According to an old belief, the Hebrew alphabet was derived from groups of stars with fixed stars for consonants and the luminaries or planets for vowels. In this starry handwriting, words were written on the walls of the heavens, which, if one could read them, spelled out the meanings of all things. You may find more about her on the website holyorderfnans.com. There are, of course, many ways to arrange the cards. The point, though, is to look at the cards, whether singly or in groups. Just by looking at them, they begin their work. Now, ha, it can be very sneaky here. <laughs> I would suggest that as you begin your study of the cards, that one, you study them in the order given from number zero to number 21. This is when you first start studying them. And two, spend at least five minutes, both before and after reading the section on each one, just looking at the cards in silence. You may wish to color a deck of cards. And currently a black and white deck can be purchased at thescienceofman.org. We now have, as of this weekend, on the holyorderofmans.com site, we have a deck of cards for sale. And their deck is suitable for coloring and comes with coloring directions as does ours. 
So you can go to the .com site for the Holy Order of Mans to, and you would go to the section that says, what are we reading? And you would find them for sale there and you just click on buy here and then you're good. Okay, that just came up, that's new. So let's go to our first card, the fool. And there's the fool. So immediately we, I have the tarot tableau. So let's look at the fool. This wonderful being that you are. So there's the fool. Looks like he's walking off a cliff. Doesn't look good for him. <laughs> and he's looking up. So we will, ex we will explain this. I'm trying to think how I can get all of these wonderful things on the screen at the same time. Oops, let's go see if I can find him. One can't do that. I have to remember to keep sliding him and come with me, go over there. We'll go up, go down here. And if I can make him smaller, so many wonderful ways of doing this. Let's see if I can make him smaller. Well, I can put him right here. So we can look at him as we go, because I do have him on this class. But So the first card that we will cover is the fool. The fool is you. There you are. <laughs> About to jump off a cliff. Not a good idea. There are 22 cards or keys in the major arcana. And here's the tarot tableau. So I reiterate that. But the fool is everywhere. It's not at the top of the of the tarot tableau it is actually between every single card because you are everywhere for study purposes it makes it easier to study if we've got the fool in one spot so as we proceed through the cards we will want to study them in the order outlined and let's continue oh here's my notes about you can buy them uh, if you want, if you want to color the cards. So each card is based on understanding the previous card. So this is important when you first start out, they, they build. It's like reading a, a novel. There are those who like to go to the last page to find out who killed who in a novel. But generally, <laughs> it's best to follow these in a particular order because they build on each other. They refer to what you've learned in a previous card what you're now currently going to learn. So you can obtain a deck of the cards of the order, whole order of man's under what are we reading. We will need to color them following the directions given carefully. I personally like using Prismacolor watercolor pencils. Um, you can color on the cards, but you can also use a brush and it changes the colors when you use a, a brush. So that's, it's kind of neat. I started, I haven't colored a deck of cards in 25 years. I started coloring our newest deck that we just had printed. And it's really easy to use the permacolors with water. So you may wish to color one at a time as I go over them. The point of you coloring them is one, to get them in front of you, and two, to create your own deck, which you won't share with anyone. Keep them in a safe place, take your time. This is not an intellectual pursuit. The first row cross contains principles. So I will do this to make it easier for you to see this. The first row cross contains principles. Those are all those guys there. The second row contains agencies and the third row contains results. These are the results of the principal card above acting through the agency below it and then that's the result. Interesting that we've got these three. And we actually will cover that one point. So you start here, you've got a concept, you have a way to manifest that concept, and then you get the results of that concept. And each one of these is a column. So we do have, we will cover them that way. And they reveal what's going on, what type of principle do you have to have in your life in order to get the results that you want. 
So each column is considered a stage of spiritual unfoldment. Paul Foster Case, one, assigned names to each of these columns, which we will go into once we have looked at the individual cards. As you look at the cards, ideas will come to you, write them down. They start talking to you, it's intriguing. The Hebrew letter assigned to this key alf. We'll go back to alf. Which we're coming up to. Its letter value is one. So the letter value is one. Its meaning is ox. So you're gonna see on this, right down here, there's a little ox. So there's these little help, helpful hints. Now it says it's letter is one. It is the zero key, but the letter is one of that. This key's ruling planet is Uranus and ruling sign is Aquarius. So you have these little things over here in the corner. The key's identity and function is superconsciousness. You will find this key on the tree of life, on the path of wisdom, and its mode of intelligence is fiery, scintillating. So according to the Book of Formation, or Sefer Yetzirah, translated by Mut Seinrich, God spoke the word of creation. This word is made up of sounds which are identified by symbols called letters. And hold on one second. I'm going to mute me. My husband is talking to someone in German right now. <laughs> so this word is made up of sounds which are identified by symbols called letters. The 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet depict all possible words. There are no vowels. So any combination of letters is a word and a word is a concept or thought. By the combinations of these 22 letters are the means by which the laws of the universe are established. Through understanding of the letters, our study here is to unravel the mysteries of these laws, use them, and thereby through experience, incorporate them into our very being. Jesus was called the word made flesh. And he promised that anything he did, we could do. So let's cut to the chase. The full card is you. I'm going to move this aside. The full card is you, the inner you, the self, the capital S self, about to engage on the grand adventure. Here you are before name or form, time or place exist. There's no time on this card. Let's see how the inner self is expressed on a card through colors and symbols. Behind the figure to the right is a white sun up here. From my explanation of colors, white is used to, to represent purity and the primal light, pure spirit. Because the sun is behind the figure, it is considered where the fool or inner self is coming from. So this is something to think about when location on a card of a symbol. So the fool is coming from the sun, which is that point of purified existence. Also, the figure moves within and is surrounded by a white oval or egg of life. The cosmic egg stands for undeveloped potential. It's not developed yet. The sun is also a symbol of the Christ and the Tao. The fool of God is the only one who can hear the Tao. Another interesting thing is we have Easter with Easter eggs. And that all goes way back to the cosmic egg, which stands for undeveloped potential. It is a pagan symbol. 10,000 years ago, the egg to symbolize our potential. And Easter is the point where Jesus expressed our potential by rising from death.
we have the fool holding a white rose. Now I'm going to bring this over because we're going to scroll down. And then you can see a little better. There's the white rose. And signifying pure, purified action. Action would be symbolized by a red rose, but here it is white. And we have a happy little white dog. We'll just go look here, running alongside. Here you have the intellect, purified and obedient to the self at a personal level. The real master is the self, not the ego, which puts the intellect first. You may wish to pause and think about that. So we are smart. We have everything we need. We, we draw on and create and figure things out. But we also have a source within us that can explain things to us and show us things which we can connect with and which is within each of us and which works perfectly well within each of us. So there's times when you won't be able to figure things out, but you will just have an answer. It's an aha moment. Say you're working on something really complicated and all of a sudden you go, oh, that's how it works. Great, all right, moving on. Contacting the inner self is like having Google on steroids. <laughs> Once you have that contact and you make that, that contact and you work with God, what a nice thought, communicate. It is not a one-way communication. It's not always praying and hoping for the best. It's actually having a conversation with a return conversation. And by acknowledging that, recognizing or recognizing that such a thing exists, which is why Jesus came and said, you can talk to our father and get a response. So the tarot teaches that too. It takes his words and helps you put them into action. And you only learn through experience. So the intellect is great, but you have to try it out. You have to bring it into the material. We talked to us, talked about that. And then we have the white undergarment. So that's this over here with a Kabbalistic name of names of God, the Tetragrammaton. It's four Hebrew letters right there on his chest. And at the top of the violet mountains in the background from Whence the fool comes, we have white snow. Violet symbolizes spiritual power and truth. It is the highest visible color vibration. So that's why. It relates to the Manipura chakra or solar plexus in our bodies. The sky behind is yellow. So the fool is surrounded by a representation of air and light and breath. Yellow also signifies alchemical mercury. In Hindu, the sattva guna and the superconscious plane of mental activity. The fool wears yellow shoes protecting his, her feet. Brown is the cliff upon which the fool stands. It represents the earthly nature. The garments are white, red, and black. These are the three qualities of the Hindu philosophy, the three gunas, which are here. White is sattva, light and consciousness. The red lining is rajas, there, desire and passion. And the black garment is tamas, inertia, typical of the physical world. So he has a coat that represents these three things. So he's put a coat on. And when you go out in the rain, you put a coat on, right? To protect you. So he's doing just that. The whole tree of life decorates the fool's outer robe. Remember that we put on a cloak to protect us from the elements, just as the 
just so the fool is protected by the tree of life, the sun, the moon, and the triple flame of consciousness. Simply put, we have the protection of the entire cosmos. It's not a bad way to start an adventure. You've got everything going for you. The fool is also carrying a wand with a wallet hanging at the end. The wallet and wand are sexual symbols. The wallet is feminine, a container of memories, and the wand is masculine, a symbol of the will. The black wand suggests occult power. The red wallet carries all of the fool's prior adventures. The lock on the wallet is the all-seeing eye. So that's the little lock up here. It creates the future and you will need spiritual sight to open it. That's why you've got a little eyeball here, little eye sitting there. That's the lock, the key. You have to have spiritual sight to open it. This sight is something that you already have. Yay. <laughs> we, have to, we don't have to go find it. And the tarot is here to help you remember that because it's all about remembering. It's, you, you don't attain anything, you are attained. You have everything that Jesus did, you already have, you've just forgotten. And the idea of the tarot is to remind you and remind you, and then you start acting on it, on those principles, and then things change in your life in a most delightful way, which is why you have to have a sense of humor. The red feather is desire raised to the highest level and symbolizes the king of the air, the eagle, which is also on the wallet, signifying the Egyptian feather of truth, which is Matt. The green wreath on the fool's head is the binding of sunlight and life power in nature. That's something very interesting. Binding of sunlight and life power in nature. Can you imagine all the plants when you go out and you look at the grass or trees or anything in nature that's growing? It is binding the sunlight in the sky with and placing it within itself. And then when you have a salad, you're eating sunlight. That's kind of neat. All of that sunlight is available to you in many ways. We are so well taken care of. The belt that the fool has wrapped around his waist is the zodiac of the 12 signs, representing time. Ah, time is coming in. So the fool straps on time before beginning the adventure. Just think, when returning from the adventure, what does the fool need to take off first in order to remove the cloak, in order to be back and one with God? So there's time. In order, when you are returning to your creator, you will be removing time and you will no longer need all of the protection because you'll be one with your creator. So the fool is looking in the direction of the unknown and new enterprises, northwestward. So that's the section of the card, which is northwestward. But with eyes looking up, the consciousness never drops. In spirituality, up means within. So whenever you say, oh, look up, we're really talking, oh, look at within yourself. Because that's your, your solar plexus is that's your star, the center of your being, the life force that God has given us beams out from your heart. Closing your eyes and going within, a sound tool for this is meditation. At the bottom of the card is a number zero, again, the symbol of the cosmic egg. The word the fool comes from the Latin word follies, meaning a bag of wind or bellows, air spirit. 
and we're running over a little, but I think we'll be able to finish up if you don't mind, unless somebody has to go. The symbol is the Hebrew alf, meaning ox. Note the head of an ox in the lower right-hand corner. Okay, let me pull him down a little bit. See, there's a little ox down there. Alf also means the number one and represents the element air. It stands for divine breath. We directly communicate with spirit every time we breathe. The yogis came up with one, came up with one breath, one movement. It quiets the mind and brings us home. I always think of it as I'm exhaling and God is inhaling. And when God exhales, I'm inhaling. Because this is God, everything around us. And we, we don't go someplace separate. Now for the great adventure. It really looks like the fool is going to fall off the cliff. Not so. The fool can't fall off the cliff. Yay. As far as the self is concerned, you never go anywhere. There isn't anywhere to go. The inner self is one with creation. There is only here, right now. Our ideas about space and size are very different than creations. That's an interesting concept. The creator is everywhere. So for it, the idea of size and place does not exist. There is only here, right now. So secure in the knowledge and protection of the cosmos, Let's take this undeveloped potential, this cosmic egg of the self, and enter the valley of experience. And what is most important and most fun will find the greatest secret of all, the wisdom of how it all works. So up above, there was a note I was referring to, Corinthians 3.18. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may, he may become wise. And then another part was from Paul Foster Case and another part was from the Tao Te Ching. So there we are. And I am going to stop share. And if anyone has a question, there you are. It's great fun. This is great fun. Because it tells us about ourselves. And it also reminds us why Jesus came and why we're here and how wonderful. I, I, I To me, it's unimaginable to come here 2000 years ago and he steps out and he talks about this and he shares this and everyone looked at him like, are you out of your mind? You know, I mean, the, the rich man really had a difficult time. He'd been kind to his parents. He'd been doing all the right things according to the, you know, the law of Moses. He was a good guy. And then Jesus said, okay, sell everything and follow me and take up your cross. And he went, I don't think so. I, okay. But what he was expressing was a trust. We learn to trust in God and not our creations. We have been raised since we were small children that we have two hands and we make our lives for ourselves. We, we get educated, we put food on our table, we put a roof over our heads and we have friends and we have a lovely life and things move along and we created it. And then there's phase two, <laughs> where Jesus said, now follow me. And then you start to realize that God creates everything and you're along for the ride. But you have to understand how it works. You have to have compassion and care and get the hang of it through experience. So the tarot expresses the types of experiences you're going to be going through and how the trust you have that God will create for you when you ask for something works. Because when each of us was born, 
I don't think there was a little envelope that came with me that said, this is how it works. <sighs> or my mom would have been a lot happier with all the <laughs> trials and tribulations of being a parent. So there is that little message in the tarot. It's mixed in there. There's only three consciousnesses we're working with, which is within ourselves, which is God, the doer, which is us, our will as to which direction we want to go in, and then the manifestation in our lives. So we learn to translate how we make things and order our lives to how God does and how if we get on board with God, life gets a whole lot better, not only for us, but everyone around us. It makes everyone happier. <clears throat> Definitely you need a sense of humor. So there you are, everyone. Another day. <laughs> and it was fun. And next week we will start right in with the magician. And you mm -hmm. can start to get an idea of what tools you have to play with on the planet Earth. Very so good. all my best. Thank you for coming and enjoying Thank it. Thank you. And Very I good. will see you all in a week. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.